the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, the short path of Hungarian tank building, round study, choosing the best capped round for early tigers, and metal beasts, the final cord for Israeli armor. Not so long ago, we introduced the second modification of the Israeli Merkava MBT, and today's Metal Beast is the latest, the fourth, modification of this famous tank. This machine is the top of the new ground tech tree for Israel. Its main caliber is a two-plane stabilized 120mm gun with elevation angles between minus 7 and plus 20 degrees. The tank is also equipped with three machine guns and grenade launchers mounted on the turret. The crew still sits in the familiar places in the turret and hull. The engine compartment placement hasn't changed either, but the units themselves saw some major improvements. Still, the main unique feature of this tank is the Trophy Active Protection System mounted on the turret. Just as the previous modifications, the Merkava 4M is a large, heavy tank. And while a weak engine limited earlier models to an unhurried pace in the second line, the situation has changed for this one. 1500 horsepower provides the mobility level almost comparable to top Leopard and Abrams tanks, while the improved transmission allows for an equal speed both forward and in reverse reaching up to 64 kph. These new features allow the Israeli top to join dynamic tank battles, quickly move around the map, change the attack direction freely, and retreat anytime necessary. The new Merkava also enjoys a variety of smoke-laying systems, 12 grenades on the turret, a mortar inside, and even the ESS likely enough for even the hottest battles. Now its passive protection produces a mixed impression. On one hand, there's way more armor now. Composite screens and NERA elements are almost everywhere, except for maybe the rear. It looks futuristic and effective and makes the Israeli tank resemble a starship. Unfortunately, it's not too confident in performing its main function. Finned discarding Sabot rounds can penetrate both the hull and the turret of the Merkava. What saves the machine is, again, a large beyond armor space, armor plates, and the good layout. Still, Merkava relies on more than just armor. It's got an efficient active protection system, the Trophy APS. Unfortunately, it can't intercept DS rounds, but does a great job with helicopter ATGMs. A good combination of passive and active protection makes this Israeli MBT one of the most resilient machines in top battles. The Merkava's armament is pretty good too. 120mm rounds are amazing at handling any enemy armor. Thermals available to the gunner and the commander will help you detect your targets, while the laser warning system will show you the direction to new threats. And there's a laser rangefinder for long-distance shots, of course. Well, that's the new Israeli top for you guys. Full of electronics and auxiliary systems, mobile, well-armed, and highly resilient. Hungarian tanks did not have a major impact in the war. They were built in small batches, got into service late, and became obsolete quickly. The tanks themselves weren't exactly Hungarian either. Their foreign routes were easy to spot. Still, we need to do them justice. The Hungarians attempted sophisticated designs, improved them, and achieved a high quality. 
Their national industry was pretty good, even though it couldn't make as many vehicles as the German one. In a parallel universe, they could have developed a tank-building school of their own, equal to the Italian or the Czech one. But fate had it otherwise. Losing the First World War proved to be catastrophic for Hungary. The 1920 treaty had the nation lose 72% of its territory, 64% of its population, vast resources and access to the sea. The navy was gone, and the army was reduced to only 35,000 troops. Military aircraft, heavy artillery, and tanks were banned. All the Hungarians could do in those challenging circumstances was establish a relationship with Italy to purchase around 150 tankettes that got old very quickly. 1938 saw a drastic change in the situation. With the help of Italy and Germany, Hungary got back its lost land in no time and began rebuilding its army openly. They had no time to develop tanks from scratch, but they did have some modern factories. It was natural to start building a licensed production. Choosing a light tank didn't take long. Hungary licensed the Swedish L60 and named it Toldi. At the time, the L60 was a pretty modern design with torsion bar suspension. However, Hungary failed to mass-produce them due to a shortage of German engines. Moreover, light tanks were soon pushed into secondary roles. The battlefields needed much more powerful machines. The medium tank took a while to find. The German Panzer IV could have been a good option, but Germany had a high demand for tanks itself. The Italians were dragging out licensing, and their machines were much worse, to be frank. A medium tank from Skoda looked like the most suitable option, but that came with its own issues. The prototype was first tested by the Germans, then by the Romanians, and then the Hungarians had to dig through lots of red tape. And when, by 1940, they finally did their own tests, and settled with the blueprints, the Czech tank was hopelessly outdated. They had no choice but to launch it into production, even that late. In 1942, Manfred Weiss factory started producing Turan medium tanks based on the Czech project. Their riveted armor made them look like museum exhibits, but they had their own strength too. Epicyclic gearbox and pneumatic servos turned out to be very comfortable to control. All tanks also received good radios and German optics. Turan's turret had three seats and a German-style cupola. The tank commander had no part in servicing the gun. Still, the Hungarians knew perfectly well that the new tank was old even before it started production. In 1943, the Turan II was made. Its frontal armor was increased to 50 millimeters, and the turret got a new 75 millimeter cannon. This made it an alternative for the Panzer IV-F, albeit two years late. The Turans saw their first battles in 1944, and despite the good skills of the Hungarian tankers, they had no chances against the IS-2 and the T-34-85. Still, the Hungarian engineers fought till the end despite all issues. They used the Turan to develop the Zdrinyi self-propelled gun, a good Stucha 42 alternative. The Turan 3 prototype received a long barrel 75mm gun and better armor. But in the same year of 1944, the Allies destroyed the Hungarian factories and the nation saw a coup d'etat soon afterwards. And that's how the five-year-long story of Hungarian tank building ended. Some machines stay popular despite the growing choice of tanks, such as the German Tiger I. Its arsenal has a large number of different rounds, and two of them are capped. 
Which one is the best? Let's try to find out by putting them to practice. We'll start with the PZGR, Panzer Granate, the one with no numbers. It's an armor-piercing, ballistic-capped round with a devastating explosive power. 285 grams of TNT equivalent. If you need a comparison, it's more than in the rounds of the famous IS-2. This projectile incapacitates the whole crew with the explosion, no matter where the penetration happens. All you need to do is, well, <laughs> get it to penetrate. But that's where you might have an issue. Despite the fact that this round is one of the upgrades, its penetration rate is lower than stock. Let's put it to the test and see if the difference is notable. We'll take a Jumbo and a regular Sherman for targets. The first one will face us almost point blank, while the second one will angle at 800 meters away. Despite being so close, the Jumbo's armor stays intact. We need to look for tiny vulnerabilities. The machine gun nest and the cupola. Still, like we said, a penetration incapacitates the whole crew. The second target has weaker armor, but if angled, is almost invincible to us. Now let's see what the stock Panzer Granate 39 can do. It has way less explosives than the previous round, but a higher penetration rate. 165 millimeters compared to 153. At first, yeah, it doesn't seem like much, but the jumbo is now suddenly much more vulnerable. This area under the mantlet can be easily penned, even at 500 meters, taking the whole crew to boot. At 800 meters, you need to aim for the MG nest and the commander's cupola again. And while a hit to the nest will take out the crew, Hitting the second vulnerability will only affect the crew in the turret. Let's switch to our second target. A regular Sherman's army can barely hold our hits. A shell to the hull takes it out right away, while hitting the turret knocks out three crew members. Let's sum up. The stock Panzer Granate 39 does a great job at destroying enemy armor at any practical distance. And even if the enemy survives a hit, a long repair time is guaranteed. The Panzer Granate is different. A single penetration is enough for any tank to leave the battle. But you might want to force shorten fire distance and aim for vulnerabilities on heavier targets. It's up to you what you want to choose. As for us, we decided we want to take both of them in a 50-50 share. The reload time allows quick switching anyway. The first question was sent by a player called Maverick E. Hey Gaijin, is there a reason why military vehicles do not go in a sequential order, like there's an F4, F5, and F105, but where are the ones in between? Hi Maverick. In fact, there's a whole number of planes with names in between, like the F11, F89, or F104, that you can find in War Thunder. Still, you're right. There are lots of holes in numbers, and they have little to do with sequences. The reason for this chaos is simple. There's no single rule for naming aircraft. Each new project receives a certain range for naming, and competing aircraft building companies pick names for their prototypes from the pool. Only one company usually wins the competition, while others have to join history and take the numbers with them. Bunny Lofi asks, what is IRST radar, and how does it work on the Flay Rack BZ-1? Black Rack Rad. Hi, Bunny. The IRST stands for Infrared Search and Track. It's a passive sensor that can detect a target's infrared signature. 
It allows a covert lock onto a target for tracking or using weaponry, including the anti-aircraft vehicles you're asking about. Another question comes from Trippy Flyweight. What's a quick way to train my crew? I'm having trouble training crew skills. Hello, Trippy Flyweight. The speed of crew training is directly connected to research points you're getting in your battles. It's more or less the same in all modes, so all you need to do is research vehicles. You can speed it up by spending Golden Eagles to purchase crew points in the Accelerated training tab. By the way, your question made us think. Maybe we should dedicate an episode to optimal crew training? What do you think about this? Tell us in the comments, please. Dirol writes, What are the orange smokes on the battlefield for? Hi there. These are target destination markers for artillery. If you see this smoke next to your tank, run! A large-caliber HE rain is incoming. And the last comment for today was written by Prez Fael Espilita. How do you calculate the effective armor thickness? Hi, Prez Fael. Well, if you don't take into account round type, ricochet tendency, a round's trajectory inside the armor and some other details, it's all about a simple calculation. Armor plate's thickness divided by the cosine of the incoming projectile's angle. However, you can always use protection analysis in War Thunder. This tool is a great opportunity to study vulnerabilities for any vehicles and rounds that consider all the details. Once again, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos, and I'm sure you don't want to miss them. I don't. Don't forget to leave a like, because we know you like them. Study your rounds and armor, and we don't mean paper rounds. Train your crews, share your thoughts and comments, and we'll see you next week.